I'm Michael Hurricane, present chair of Friends of Victoria Park and what I'm going to do today is take you on a guided tour of our park for Doors Open Day 2020. Come with me and I hope you enjoy. We start the walk at the main gate made at the McFarlane Works in Postle Park, known popular as the Saracen Works. Here we see the plaque to Provost Ferguson. It was at his instigation that the parks were was opened. Unfortunately, he didn't live to see this. It was actually opened by Andrew McLean. The idea was this was a downturn in industry in the period, in the shipping industry, and it's to keep skilled men in employment. Here we see Victoria. Now, in her honour, the park was opened for her, her Silver Jubilee, 1887. Here we see Partick Borough Arms. Industria Ditta, that's the motto. Hard work in riches. Very much a Victorian sentiment for the times. The park gates were paid for by the good ladies of Partick. A cost of 100, some say 200 pounds, much less than the restoration cost. That's, res that's um, inflation for you. Here we see, over there on my right, um, some facilities of Glasgow Life. I don't know how many of them are open during this uh, COVID period, but I'm sure if you get in touch, they'll be able to tell you. Um, sports facilities in the park provided by Glasgow Life are free, and I think we should uh, bless our city for that. Marvellous lime trees. These feature uh, in public spaces and in parks, parts in the Victorian era. They're now getting rather aged, a um, hundred years old or more, some of them. And uh, I do hope our council's got a plan for replacing these wonderful um, heritage trees uh, with something suitably grand. And on this site was a grand pavilion, bandstand, that was erected around the 10th century, early 1900s, at the cost of £1,900. You wouldn't really get much for that now. And people used to gather there in the afternoons and uh, enjoy this, this wonderful park. Um, behind us now, if we, we just moved now, there's a memorial. A memorial to one of the worst shipping disasters um, in this part of the world anyway, the SS Daphne. The SS Daphne was launched in 1883. It was actually built on the other side of the river, Stevens in, in Govan, but many men from this part of the world, you know, from Whitehinch and Scotland, worked in these yards and they all gathered to watch the launch in 1883. Nobody is quite sure how many people were on board and we'll come to why that's important later. But they all watched to launch the, um, the launch of this ship. The ship was not fully kitted out. It yet to have its boilers installed and other works that couldn't be done in Govan. And it was to be uh, towed on, on, to um, the Broomy Law. Now, whilst it was being launched, one of the chains that was supposed to impede the progress into the main part of the river slipped and the whole ship began to list and, and to tilt. Because of the amount of loose gear, they think about 30 tonnes of it, that, that would be workmen's tools, chains, all sorts of things uh, that would be on board a ship were, were not tied down. They slipped and the whole ship went over. And because it wasn't fully fitted out as well, there were hatches in the hull that would normally have been closed, so the water rapidly caused the vessel to sink. Now some estimates say 124, some people say as, as high as 190 died uh, that day. Uh, the reason we're not sure is because nobody is quite sure how many people were on board at the time. Because the ship owners, not wanting to waste a minute, had people working on the ship whilst it was being launched. 
unsafe, you might say. Now, afterwards, there was an inquiry, and do you think the ship owners were found guilty? <laughs> I think we know the answer to that question. However, afterwards, there were laws introduced that limited the number of people on board at the launch of a ship to those essential for the launch. So safety did come out of it. Now, we've talked about the good ladies of Partick at the gates. The good ladies of Partick did something else very beneficial to the families of the neighbourhood. At that time, it was all about doing the right thing. And you couldn't show your face at funeral if you didn't have the right bonnet to, to appear there. And the good ladies of Partick paid for all the widows to have a bonnet for the funerals of their men. This commemorative um, plaque is actually the third of its kind. Um, the first one was stolen, we believe for scrap because it was made of bronze. It was then replaced. This is actually a resin cast because we didn't want to make the same mistake again. Friends of Victoria Park uh, raised money for this. And the resin copy was then stolen. Um, and I think the thieves, um, perhaps disappointed with their gains on this occasion, have not stolen this now third plaque in, in remembrance of the men uh, who died in that, that terrible shipping disaster. Here are some of the formal flower beds that go to make up this uh, designed landscape as recognised by Historic Scotland, one of four in Glasgow. And over on my far right, as it were, there's um, a perhaps contentious area of the park, the Blaze Pitches area, whose uh, future is still as yet undecided. But uh, recently, in the last year, a SCIO has been formed, a Scottish Char Charitable Incorporated organisation, uh, which various park bodies have chosen to join and associate with. And we're hoping to bring together a positive vision for the park, for all the areas of the park, including the Blaze Pitches area. I might be slightly biased, but um, I think Friends of Victoria Park had a very good community orchard plan uh, a few years ago. But um, anyway, we'll see. We'll see what happens. Uh, it's, it's all um, up for grabs. Here we are at the site of the other bandstand in Victoria Park. Yes, it had two. Behind me is the seating area. Forming a sort of amphitheatre style. And the bandstand itself would have been in front of me. Now, the period dates from the interwar years, um, 20s, 30s, and you wonder whether the construction of it might have been something in the same spirit as that which, in that which the park was built, public works, because of the downturn, the depression. Now, it forms a site where Friends of Victoria Park have their annual Easter egg rolling. Unfortunately, this year, sadly, cancelled due to COVID as so much. Anyway, we'll move on now to the Fossil Grove. Right, now I'm going to take you back in time. 358 million years ago to the Carboniferous era, which lasted about 60 million years uh, to about 299 million years ago. Climate was entirely different there. Scotland was a different place. It was near the equator. Warm tropical. Perhaps some of you would like it like that again. Uh, yeah, this area would have been a, a tropical swamp, if you like. And it's when such a swamp flooded that trees were knocked over, which formed the fossil remains, which I'll, I'll talk more about. Here we're heading towards a, a model of these trees. And here, from the Commonwealth Games, we have this uh, legacy benefit. This is a model of what a replica, if you like, of one of the lycopod trees. A great deal smaller than the original trees, which would have been 30 or 40 meters. Absolutely huge. More to scale. On this trunk here, you can see a giant millipede. During the Carboniferous era, millipedes could be two meters long. Absolutely enormous, due to the greater oxygen in the atmosphere. A very, very different time period. 
So these lycopod, or scale trees, were very important plants in that era, the Carboniferous. Right, well, here we are at the fossil house for the fossil grove. I'll introduce here a very important character in this narrative, Isdale Robertson. I may have mentioned him at the gates, and if I didn't, forgive me. He was the foreman for the Oswald family. He was a clerk of works, if you like. And a road was being cut through the former quarry, Dollarite Quarry, Windstone, it's popularly known. And his workmen came across something which, quite frankly, astonished them. And as a man, I think, of foresight and imagination, Isdale told them to stop, and they contacted Glasgow University. The Glasgow University's geology department came down and examined the fossil stumps and uh, were suitably impressed. So if it wasn't for Isdale, we wouldn't have these glorious carboniferous fossil remains of the lycopod trees of which I spoke earlier. The house itself dates from 1890. Park the channel was being cut in 1886 during the works to create the park. The park, as you'll remember, was opened in 1887. They were initially covered over, but this fossil house was erected, the first building of its type in the world to protect a geological feature. And I think we should remember it as very important for that. And if you look at these lovely pillars, Marvellous cast iron. Probably from the Saracen works, as were the gates of the park. Here we are at the rear elevation of the fossil house. Again, these lovely cast iron pillars, the McFarlane works. In a sense, the fossil remains emblematic of the history of Glasgow during this period and the importance of the Carboniferous period, from whence the coal seams came, which powered the Industrial Revolution. McFarlane had one of the largest ironworks in the 19th century. Originally started around the site of where the Saracen's Head pub is in the East End, and then they moved to the Postle Estate. He wanted to build a model town, model workers, but he became known as the Laird of Fossil Town because due to the emissions of his works and the, the coal-fired you know, steam power of the day, everything turned black. Um, historians of the day remarked on how there was sooty rain in Glasgow and when it snowed, it turned grey. So um, perhaps we want to think about that with the uh, continuing emissions of uh, fossil fuels, less visible, but equally dangerous to our health. So here we are. Here we are in the uh, Quarry Now area. The toppermost layer, that's the dolerite intrusion, which occurred later, capping the Carboniferous era strata in which the fossils are. Friends Victoria Park has actually been developing a fernery project in this area. Ferns were a very important species in the Carboniferous. They actually originated in the Devonian, which is the era which preceded the Carboniferous, but they were very important. Here we are, Cenotaph. We're on the pink granite plinth of the glorious bronze by Francis William Doyle Jones evidence sculpture of the period. It was erected in 1922 after approval from the Monuments Commission. Plans were submitted in 1921. We will remember them. A simple inscription at the Second World War. And above that, for the men of Partick and Whiteinch who fell in the Great War, our beloved dead. A sword encased in a laurel wreath. Here we see the figure of peace crowns the heroes. Well, this is the boating pond. Now in the former times, turn of the century, there was a great pavilion where men would house their model boats and that they come at the weekends to, to sail them on the, on the boating ponds. The 
formal flower beds again across this designed landscape. Friends of Victoria Park actually helped to preserve these. There was a plan by the council to remove about 22 of them, roughly a third, but um, we very much oppose that. Don't feed me bread. <laughs> Public information thing. It's much more healthy to feed uh, bread's uh, seed, maybe even cooked vegetables. Right, well, here we are at the wonderful Oswald Clock. Called the Oswald Clock, however, it was very much erected at the insistence of Isdale Robertson, of whom we spoke earlier. Four faces. Now, though he was involved in construction of the park, he was also involved in building works after that. Um, and some say it's so his workers would have absolutely no excuse for not knowing what the time is and coming to work, to work late. A great temperance man, and these inscriptions, now is the day of salvation, relate very much to this. It's never too late to turn to the Lord in Isdale Robertson's world. He was the son of a weaver from series five, who did very, very well for himself. He rose to eventually becoming a councillor, Partick Borough Council. These are the colours of Partick Borough Council. Gold and red, restored uh, the uh, Friends of Victoria Park. As you see, the clock actually keeps time, <laughs> pretty much, unlike many, many of the clocks in Glasgow. And on the other side, 1887, which of course was the year of Queen Victoria's Jubilee and the opening of the park. Although the clock itself was not erected until 1888. I think it took that long for uh, Isdale to persuade uh, the Oswalds to actually um, erect it and pay for it, but it was very much at his insistence. We can see a fine view now of the, uh, the formal beds. The entrance to the park. The entrance to the park was actually around here. It was wider than the gates are now to accommodate carriages. Because if you're a well-to-do Victorian living in your mansion, Belchagre, um, what you do is you ride down to the park, take a ride around it in your carriage, around the ponds. Very, very pleasant, I'm sure. I'm going to take you now to the Curling Club Pavilion. And by the magic video, I'll correct an, an error that occurs later. The resolution of the club is actually 1901. And the second world, the second bandstand was actually constructed in 1930. The bell of the borough of Partick, the old bell, that was presented by Mr. John Ross in 1859. And I've, I've recently met, I've been in contact rather with uh, Billy and Pat of the Curling Club, who assure me that they still have it. It's in very safe hands and will be looked after by the club. Curling Club Pavilion. Our walk would normally end up at the Curling Club, where we'd have a lovely cup of tea and a biscuit. Fortunately, the Curling Club have left their old clubhouse, this wonderful historic building you can see behind me, red brick, very characteristic um, building type for Victoria Park. The uh, fossil house was also built in that style and uh, the pavilion, now sadly gone. So unfortunately this year, we can't get in. But perhaps next year we'll be able to. The Curling Club was one of the earliest clubs to establish its presence in the park, where it moved from Byers Road, Curlers, I'm sure you've kind of heard of that. That's where the original Curling Club was, was sort of based, and then it moved to Victoria Park, where it remained until this year, where sadly they've departed. Uh, taking amongst with them some wonderful memorabilia, including the old bell at the borough of Partick. And with a resolution of the club in the 19th century, it was resolved that bell should never leave the borough of Partick. And let's hope that it doesn't. Thank you for coming with me on this virtual tour of Victoria Park, or Whitehinch Park, as it was formerly known by the residents around here. Thank you. I'm Michael Harrigan, Chair of Friends of Victoria Park.